Welcome to Module 6, Kidney Replacement Therapy, Home Dialysis. This module is designed to help our non-nephrology nurse colleagues who are also caring for our patients with or at risk for chronic kidney disease in other settings, learn more about their disease and therapy. The content of this module is an overview of home dialysis that is primarily self-managed by patients, but also involves family and other caregivers. This set of modules, Chronic Kidney Disease, What Every Nurse Caring for the Patient with CKD Should Know, is dedicated to the memory of Sally Burroughs Hudson, a past president of ANNA, and a fierce proponent of continuing education for all nurses. This is the sixth module in the series created by the American Nephrology Nurses Association, ANNA, and should be viewed in conjunction with module one. Home dialysis is ranked second to transplantation for positive outcomes of kidney replacement therapy. However, just over 12% of our kidney failure patients do home dialysis. This module will discuss the basics of peritoneal and home hemodialysis and the nursing care of patients in stage 5 CKD who are dialyzing at home. The nephrology nurses who have created these modules have done so believing that your understanding of our shared patients and their therapies will enhance our shared care of them and our communication. And as you go through this module, you'll see terms highlighted by an asterisk, which indicates that the term is defined in the downloadable glossary. In addition to the narrated slides, you'll find a list of suggested resources for further information, along with links to the glossary, reference list, case studies, and a post-test. Please see the final slides of this module for more details. Welcome to this presentation. Let's begin with the specific learning objectives. As a result of this module, you'll be able to define home dialysis and list the treatment options, describe the benefits of home dialysis, discuss modality education and patient choice selection, and describe basic principles and process of home dialysis options. And you'll be able to list the challenges of home dialysis. Module one covered the causes, stages, and treatments for CKD. The goal of all patient-centered care is to match each patient with the best therapy option for them. It is also the law. The 2008 federal regulations for the Medicare end-stage renal disease program state that the patient should be informed about all treatment modalities and settings, including but not limited to transplantation, home dialysis modalities, both hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, and in-center hemodialysis. When patients need kidney replacement therapy in the form of dialysis, Home dialysis is one of the options that the patient and the nephrology team must consider. The federal regulations describe this option as home dialysis, meaning dialysis performed with little or no professional assistance by a, pa by a patient with kidney failure or caregiver who has completed an appropriate course of training as specified in the regulations. Another way to define home dialysis is with a brief history of dialysis. In the 1950s, some acute kidney failure patients' lives were saved by acute hemodialysis treatments. In the 1960s, long-term vascular access creation meant chronic hemodialysis could save the lives of patients with chronic kidney failure. However, limited resources meant that patients fortunate enough to be selected for treatment had to dialyze themselves at home. So began dialysis in the home setting. With the advancement of technology and mounting pressure resulting from many patients dying of kidney failure due to lack of care and financial resources, the US government made kidney failure part of the Medicare Disability Program in 1972. At that time, 
40% of patients were doing self-care at home. And while many home hemodialysis uh, programs still flourished, especially in rural areas, in-center dialysis centers in hospitals became the norm. Not just outpatient hemodialysis three times per week, but also inpatient peritoneal dialysis with a 48 hour stay per week. This changed in the early 1980s when a rapid expansion of science and industry occurred, headlined by the introduction of continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, CAPD. This revolutionized PD as a highly effective but simple dialysis method that patients could do for themselves daily at home. This began a new era of self-care for dialysis with significant increases in the number of self-care patients. The 1990s saw the proliferation of freestanding in-center hemodialysis units for assisted dialysis with the result that self-care dialysis numbers stagnated due to the lack of nephrology referrals and nursing expertise. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, the high morbidity and mortality of in-center hemodialysis as compared to other first world countries led the US to focus increased attention on contributing factors. Research such as the reintroduction of nocturnal home and the introduction of daily hemodialysis in Toronto demonstrated significant clinical benefits. Additionally, more frequent hemodialysis and self-care in general led to greatly improved patient outcomes at a fraction of the cost. In the 2000 era, the increase in mortality morbidity of assisted in-center hemodialysis led to increased attention to factors that showed that more frequent hemodialysis and PD resulted in greatly improved patient outcomes. Advances in less costly and more portable technology led to advancements in home dialysis. In 2011, to promote the benefits of self-care programs, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Service introduced a bundle of financial program incentives for self-care by waiving the three-month waiting period for Medicare eligibility for PD and to increase the professional training reimbursement for home hemodialysis. Most recently in 2019, an executive order was announced to increase the number of incident patients who could benefit from home therapies and transplant, stating that greater rates of home dialysis and transplantation will improve quality of life and care for patients who require dialysis and may limit the, eliminate the need for dialysis altogether for many patients. At that time, there were many good reasons to increase the home dialysis options, but unwittingly, 2020 provided an unanticipated one, a pandemic of a novel virus that makes therapies at home so much safer for our kidney failure patients than in-center assisted therapy. With the combined impetus of these last two historical occurrences in mind, and to put the executive order of increased transplant and home dialysis into perspective, these data show us where we are now. As stated by the 2020 USRDS, the executive order on advancing American kidney health envisions increased utilization of preemptive transplantation and home dialysis in patients with incident kidney failure. This figure displays the cumulative number of patients who received a preemptive transplant or initiated home dialysis for kidney treatment each year. In 2018, that count reached 18,631, an increase of nearly 10% from 2017 and a near doubling since 2008. More than three quarters of the population initiating kidney replacement with home dialysis or a kidney transplant in 2018 utilized peritoneal dialysis. 
the number of prevalent patients with kidney failure who performed home dialysis at the end of 2018 was almost 70,000, an increase of almost 8% from 2017. That represents the highest rate of growth since 2013, shortly before a shortage of peritoneal dialysis fluid occurred, which likely limited subsequent growth over the next couple of years. At the end of 2018, home dialysis utilization stood at 12.4% of all dialysis patients, with nearly 85% of patients on home dialysis performing peritoneal. That mix of home modalities has been relatively stable between 2009 and 2018. The bottom line, however, is that the number of patients doing home dialysis is currently only 12.4% of the total dialysis population. To reach the 80% by 2025 as mandated in the 2019 executive order requires a greater than five-fold increase in the additional number of patients doing home dialysis or receiving a transplant. Before we move on to how that can be made possible, let's look at the science projecting the increase in the incident and prevalent prevalent kidney failure population through 2025 and beyond. This graph shows a forecast of astounding growth in a population needing life-sustaining care. The authors of this paper conclude that the burden of kidney failure will increase in the United States population through 2030 due to demographic, clinical, and lifestyle shifts in the population and improvements in kidney replacement therapy. Planning for KRT resource allocation should allow for substantial continued growth in the population of patients with kidney failure. Future interventions should be directed to preventing the progression of CKD to kidney failure. Logically, from the perspectives of both access and resources, both financial and environmental, this can only be possible by expanding the science and technology of transplantation and home dialysis before and after kidney failure. But there is an even more compelling reason beyond the executive order and in addition to following the law to actualize and increase self-dialysis for our patients. Consider this pertinent definition of self-care dialysis by Susan Bray. It is a modality which introduces the patient into a continuum of, of care, ranging from dependency to independence. Greater knowledge of the dialytic process itself is achieved. It is thus a means by which patients can again achieve an active and meaningful lifestyle associated with a feeling of physical and emotional well-being. The concept of self-care dialysis aligns with Aram's nursing theory. This self-care deficit nursing theory developed by Dorothy Aram was based on a philosophy that all patients wish to care for themselves. This is where nurses shine. Nurses determine these deficits and define a support modality to meet them until such time as the patient is able to assume this care himself, the point when the deficit no longer exists. In doing so, patients are enabled and empowered to care for themselves, knowing that they have a partner in care. Patient can explore the self-care dialysis options available. Nephrology nurses actualize this with the aid of our scope of practice and standards of care, knowing that patient control of the learning process and personal involvement in the treatment and rehabilitation process increase adherence and improve quality of life. Following the nursing process, our intervention is to report our findings regarding patient interest in and desired for self-care or home dialysis to the interdisciplinary team. 
We also detail our assessment of patients' abilities and limitations specific to the performance of self-care dialysis or the availability of caregivers at home. We provide recommendations for home dialysis education and training. And if the patient is not yet a candidate for home dialysis, we provide recommendations for self-care education and skill building. Following the initial home visit, the home training nurse provides recommendations for any home modification required. We collaborate with the interdisciplinary team and patient to establish realistic goals for home dialysis and to develop an educational plan that focuses on the necessary skills for home dialysis. Before teaching begins, Consider health literacy and individualize the approach by considering the patient's cultural and health beliefs, preferences, and wishes. We assess and provide missing information regarding kidney replacement therapies using techniques and materials appropriate for the patient's developmental stage, culture, and disabilities. We not only teach all aspects of home dialysis, but we also teach about transplant as this is the optimal therapy for the suitable patient and our self-care dialysis patients are frequently listed and waiting for a transplant. Simply stated, the purpose of the comprehensive evaluation is to assure that we are matching patient care to patient and family goals. We discuss the timeline for the evaluation process and explain the patient's and family role in the evaluation and decision processes. We also describe the role of each healthcare team member in the evaluation and decision process. And most importantly, we teach patients how to set goals and develop strategies to meet their personal learning needs as appropriate and help them understand both the benefits and the challenges of home dialysis. The overall advantages of home dialysis are that the patients are able to control their own treatment schedules, resulting in increased independence and flexible lifestyles. Many patients find it easier to maintain employment status, especially if they begin KRT on peritoneal dialysis. These patients also report an increased sense of well being and say they have more energy and are able to perform regular daily activities such as work or school. This positive experience leads to increased adherence to the prescribed therapy. Also, because of the increased amount of dialysis they do, patients' diets and fluid intake tend to be more liberal. One of the greatest benefits to self-care dialysis is the ease of travel. Much of the equipment is portable and supplies can be shipped as needed. PD treatments can be done by the patient alone, and even some hemodialysis patients may not require the help of a partner or caregiver. Add to all this that more frequent dialysis and self-care lead to decreased morbidity and mortality. Enhanced clinical outcomes, treatment done at the patient's convenience and, and increased environmental safety, and all at decreased provider expense, make self-care dialysis a win-win-win option. This slide clearly shows the benefit of increased survival for the 12 plus doing self-care home dialysis and giving them more time and opportunity to know the benefits to realize the superior benefits of a kidney transplant. These benefits and numbers, however, raise the question, if home dialysis is so great, why aren't more patients doing it? There are many reasons. And the main one is that the majority of patients don't receive enough care and education in the early stages of CKD. These patients must start dialysis urgently when they are too sick to care for themselves, and it's become customary to start them on assisted in-center hemodialysis. Many patients, upon seeing the complexity of in-center hemodialysis, don't realize that they could be trained to perform hemodialysis or PD at home. Patients will not know unless they are educated. Change is happening though. 
Recently, urgent start peritoneal dialysis was introduced in response to the trend that advanced CKD patients requiring imminent dialysis could not do PD because of the waiting time needed between catheter placement and catheter use. These patients ended up with temporary central venous catheters on hemodialysis. It is becoming apparent now though, through recent publications and educational programs, that PD can be offered as urgent dialysis modality and successfully initiated even in the late referred patient who requires urgent initiation of dialysis. In these cases, PD begins as nurse-assisted dialysis until the patients can be trained in self-care at home. This type of urgent start gives the patients the benefits of PD in the early years of therapy with the option for a kidney transplant for many. And if sometime in the future PD adequacy is not as good, these patients are ideal trainees for home hemodialysis. But home dialysis is not for everybody with kidney failure. There are many potential challenges. Here are some from the MATCH-D resource, not necessarily prioritized. We must consider the patient's physical setup. They need a place of residence with ample storage for supply. This poses a challenge among homeless patients. Then there is personal hygiene. The patient should be able to exhibit hygienic habits and attitudes. Because of the constant risk of infection, the patient should be educated and deemed competent in personal hygiene. And they must have a clean room in which to dialyze. This is an essential part of sound infection control practices. For machine dependent home dialysis, there must be a reliable source of electrical power. And then there are patient issues. Impaired cognitive faculties or mental illness can make the learning and implementation of unassisted dialysis difficult. And last but not least is the challenge of non-adherence. Simply stated, any home-based therapy and its success depends on patient and caregiver adherence. Some providers discourage non-adherent patients from selecting home dialysis because of patient safety issues. The flip side to these challenges is that we have evidence that when patients are educated about dialysis options, nearly 45 to 60% choose home. But wait, there's more. Here are six international studies done over a span of 15 years that represent some 1500 patients showing that more than 45% chose home dialysis after education on this option. The sad part is that we have other studies showing that patients do not feel informed about their care options prior to starting dialysis. Some 80% of these respondents said that doctors did not ask them about their values and preferences for dialysis options. It is noteworthy here to cite evidence in the literature that nephrologists, when asked what dialysis therapy they would choose, 90% chose self-care modality with assisted care only if necessary. Patients want to be informed about modality options. This study shows that they specifically want to know about side effects, quality of life, what the physical act impact might be, and yes, survival data. Not only do these patients want to know, they have a legal right to know. Remember that this disease is a Medicare disability. In the CMS conditions for coverage, the law states that providers need to ensure that comprehensive education is provided and that patients' preferences are incorporated into their care plan. The good news is that there are lots of great patient education resources, such as those provided by the Nonprofit Medical Education Institute, MEI, through Home Dialysis Central, which was developed to raise awareness and use of peritoneal dialysis. 
Home Dialysis Central is designed for patients to learn how they can have the best life possible with self-care dialysis. It can be found online at homedialysis.org. A useful assessment tool developed by MEI is the method to assess treatment choices for home dialysis, MATCH-D. This tool, which can be found through Home Dialysis Central, can help the interdisciplinary nephrology team identify and assess candidates for home dialysis therapies. MATCH-D is designed to sensitize clinicians to key issues about who can use home dialysis. One of the most valuable patient education resources we recommend to our patients and staff is Kidney School, which was also developed by MEI and can be found online at kidneyschool.org. As advertised, this is an interactive web-based learning program designed to help people learn what they need to know to understand kidney disease and its treatment options. This slide illustrates another of the tools developed to assist patients making an informed choice. By opening the website, any patient can find the following message and invitation. If your kidneys fail, dialysis can save your life. But dialysis is not just a medical treatment. It can also affect every aspect of your lifestyle. This tool will help you choose the right treatment for you so you can feel your best and live the way you want to. The goal is to empower all patients to be central to the decision making and making an informed choice. These tools help the patient understand what option works best for them to do what they want to do with the rest of their lives. And the next several slides are designed to help you understand how these home dialysis options work. We will start with peritoneal dialysis as it is the modality, as it is the modality that the majority of our self-care dialysis patients choose. Peritoneal dialysis cleans the blood and removes excess fluids using one of the body's own membranes, the peritoneum, as the filter. PD solution is placed inside the peritoneal cavity. Over several hours, waste and fluid pass through the semi-permeable peritoneal membrane into the solution. Later, the solution and waste are drained from the abdomen and replaced with fresh solution. This bloodless modality, in contrast to hemodialysis, which clears the blood directly, is an everyday treatment that is usually performed at home with or without assistance from a partner. Small children, the very elderly or disabled patients need a caregiver partner. Training is initiated in center and the patient transfers to the home setting once they have demonstrated competence and mastery of the modality. Support staff is available round the clock and patients visit the dialysis training center monthly for labs and to meet with the healthcare team. Patients note greater independence with this modality, which allows them more control of their schedule and the freedom to travel, as well as positive clinical outcomes. Many of these same benefits are enjoyed by patients who choose home hemodialysis. Hemodialysis literally means blood cleaning and is a process where the patient's blood is continuously removed in small quantities through a vascular access. The blood then travels through the tubing to the dialyzer on the hemodialysis machine where waste and fluid are removed. The cleaned blood is then returned back to the patient through the vascular access. Teaching for home hemodialysis starts in the dialysis center and once the patient gains competence and mastery of this more complex modality, the patient then transfers to the home setting where treatments are done usually with the assistance or at least presence of a partner during the day or night. The patient chooses the treatment schedule according to his dialysis prescription. More on that later. Again, support staff is available 24 seven. And while patients typically mail in their blood samples, they also meet monthly with their healthcare team. 
Both of these home therapies require that the patient's home have sufficient utilities and storage space to support and house the equipment and supplies. Additionally, the designated area must be kept free and clinically clean. These requirements, plus the lack of a care partner at home, may pose barriers to home therapy for some patients. Before we discuss the patient care details of these options, let's review the physical principles of dialysis for both hemo and peritoneal dialysis. The two major principles are diffusion and osmosis. Remember that one of the primary functions of the kidneys is to remove metabolic waste products and excess fluid. Diffusion is the movement of solutes from an area of higher solute concentration to an area of lower solute concentration. Diffusion of waste across the semipermeable membrane into the dialysate is the primary mechanism of waste removal in both hemo and peritoneal dialysis. It is the amount of diffusion needed to not only prevent uremia, but to sustain quality of life that is determined and that is termed adequacy of dialysis. Osmosis is the movement of water from an area of lower solute concentration to an area of higher solute concentration across a semipermeable membrane. Fluid removal in peritoneal dialysis by osmosis involves two steps, water transport from the peritoneal capillaries to the interstitium and water transport across the peritoneal membrane into the peritoneal cavity. Fluid removal is influenced by many factors such as permeability and surface area of the peritoneal membrane, colloid oncotic pressure, hydrostatic pressure gradient, dwell time, and the amount of lymphatic absorption. Fluid removal in hemodialysis is called ultrafiltration. The hemodialysis machine is programmed to exert negative pressure on the dialyzer membrane to remove a predetermined amount of fluid during the dialysis treatment. The semipermeable membrane in PD is the peritoneal membrane. And in hemodialysis, it is the fiber of, fibers of the hollow fiber dialyzer. The benefits of peritoneal dialysis begin with a slower decline in residual kidney function compared to hemodialysis, which helps the patient slow down the ultimate total kidney failure while maintaining some benefits of normal function. This allows many patients to start PD using an incremental prescription, for example, every other day or five days per week rather than every day if they have enough urine output pushed by diuretics, making full dose PD unnecessary. Additionally, peritoneal dialysis does a great job of effective solute and water removal while providing continuous therapy, which acts more like natural kidneys. It is also relatively simple technically, which makes it a good choice for home, giving the patient greater autonomy and independence as compared to in-center hemodialysis and allows them to maintain employment more easily. And they might experience fewer negative side effects such as nausea, vomiting, cramping, and fluid weight gain than with in-center hemodialysis. It can also allow for fewer dietary restrictions and can be done while sleeping. And for those who really don't like needles, PD treatments are needle free. There are challenges that need to be addressed to minimize the risk of them becoming problems. While some patients are initiating PD on an intermittent schedule, they will need to adjust to scheduling dialysis into their daily routine, seven days a week, once they no longer make very much urine. From the physical viewpoint, PD requires a permanent catheter, exiting outside the body, and that means they run the risk of infection, peritonitis. Also, they may gain weight, and have a larger waistline. Very large patients may need extra therapy. 
They will also need ample storage space in the home for supplies and space in the bedroom for equipment, including the PD machine. All of these challenges require responsibility and detailed training. Additionally, while PD is an excellent self-dialysis modality, especially for patients newly diagnosed with kidney failure, not all patients are suitable candidates. Some of the potential contraindications to PD are listed on this slide. As you can see, they are for the most part relatively rare physical complications, some of which are very treatable. The medical assessment will inform the team of the appropriateness of PD for the individual patient. Indeed, recent literature now shows that 75% of all patients are medically suitable for PD. And while it has been thought that a major contraindication to any self-care therapy is a history of non-adherence to prescribed therapy, it is important to keep in mind that non-adherence becomes an issue with prescribed treatment that is not the patient's choice. Remember the slides about informed choice, education and tools? To understand both the principles and procedures for these dialysis options, Let's first look at the basics of peritoneal dialysis. First, an indwelling catheter is surgically placed through the wall of the abdomen into the peritoneal cavity. This PD catheter allows for the infusion of PD solution called dialysate into the peritoneal cavity. The fill volume ranges from 30 mils per kilogram to 50 mils per kilogram. To begin a cycle of PD, about two liters for an average size adult of dialysate fluid is infused through the catheter into the peritoneal cavity where it dwells for a prescribed period of time. During that time, waste products diffuse from the blood rich peritoneum into the dialysate and excess fluid moves from the blood into the dialysate as well. This is facilitated by the use of varying concentrations of dextrose solutions which creates the concentration gradient across the membrane and activates the exchange via osmosis. The used dialysate is drained from the cavity, discarded and replaced by fresh dialysate, beginning a new cycle or exchange. The success of PD depends upon the catheter, which needs more explanation. Most peritoneal dialysis catheters are flexible tubes that are surgically or interventionally implanted through the abdominal wall into the peritoneal cavity. The intra-abdominal segment of the tube has multiple ports that allow bi-directional flow of the dialysate solution. The insertion side of the catheter, called the exit site, is usually an inch below and to the side of the navel and the catheter extends four to six inches out of the body. After catheter placement, scar tissue is allowed to form around the incision for usually about two to three weeks prior to the beginning of dialysis. This scarring securely anchors the midsection of the catheter via a single or a double cuff. The catheter site is called the exit site. A relatively recent innovation in catheter placement and healing is known as burying the catheter. This procedure is being used for patients in early stage five who have chosen PD, but are not yet in symptomatic kidney failure and do not yet need dialysis. In this method, the external portion of the catheter is tunneled and buried under the skin until it is needed. This prevents infection while keeping the patient ready to start dialysis when necessary. At that time, the end of the catheter is dissected out and can be used immediately. In contrast, the urgent start method is gaining popularity. While it is important to know that the ideal situation is to maintain immobility of the catheter for the healing process of two to three weeks, if the patient has chosen PD as their therapy of choice and needs dialysis immediately, the catheter can be used within 24 hours. This would be done by a trained dialysis clinician or nurse, either in the acute setting or outpatient setting, 
and training facility where training done during care would be intermittent for two weeks by the dialysis staff. The patient would then be trained to the home prescription the third week and discharged home wherever that may be, including extended care settings. The illustration on the left shows two basic styles of PD catheters, each of which has multiple flow holes and a double cuff. On the right, you can see the Y-tubing connector set that allows inflow and outflow through a closed system to help prevent infection. The exit site is not always in the mid-abdomen, as many patients have upper abdomen and presternal exit sites. It is very important the exit site is placed where the patient can see it easily to care for it daily. For the suitable and motivated patient, there are two methods of peritoneal dialysis. Continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, CAPD, which is a manual method that does not require a machine, and automated peritoneal dialysis, which is known as continuous cycling peritoneal dialysis, CCPD, and uses a machine called a cycler. CAPD is the original form of self-care PD, but it is not as commonly used now. These are the steps for each exchange. During the dwell time, the patient is able to proceed with regular activities, hence the name ambulatory. Some patients are trained to do CAPD so that if they are traveling, have machine problems, or experience a power outage, they can continue their dialysis. CAPD offers patients the greatest self-care flexibility because they can do treatments virtually anywhere, at home, on vacation, or at work. The most common method of PD is called either continuous cycling peritoneal dialysis or automated peritoneal dialysis. The benefit of CCPD is less work for the patient and a lower risk for peritonitis due to fewer connections and disconnections. Shown here are some examples of small and portable PD machines. The machines average around 25 pounds in weight and 2.5 cubic feet in size. To set up the machine and do an exchange, a patient typically needs the supplies listed here. In a perfect world, all this decision making takes place before the patient actually needs to begin dialysis. But whatever the circumstances, all care is carefully prescribed with the primary goal of patient safety. Once a patient and the interdisciplinary nephrology team make a decision for self-care dialysis, a dialysis prescription is formulated to manage all of the details specific to that patient's care. The prescription for PD will include placement of the PD catheter, usually an outpatient procedure, post exit site care for approximately two weeks, training to use the PD catheter, usually beginning with small volumes of the prescribed dialysate, the number of exchanges per day, the diet, medications, lab testing, and clinic visits for maintenance care. This slide gives an overview of the training necessary for the patient to be successful doing PD at home. There are also some limitations of PD as a kidney replacement therapy that must be mentioned. Obviously, the prescription must be such that this dialysis therapy will replace lost kidney function. Or put another way, is the treatment adequate to meet the patient's physiological wellness needs? We know that PD is best used for patients with some residual kidney function, although anuric patients may also do very well. Most patients who start PD will eventually transfer to other kidney replacement therapy modalities, such as hemodialysis, if adequacy 
cannot be maintained because of membrane failure or due to other complications such as recurrent peritonitis or problems with the exit site or catheter. Because achieving adequate clearance in large or heavy patients can be difficult, and because the caloric load that comes from the glucose in PD solutions can result in additional weight gain, overweight and obese patients have been discouraged by some providers from selecting PD as a kidney replacement therapy option. Should these patients require hemodialysis if kidney transplant is not an option at that time, staying at home with hemodialysis could be an option. Home hemodialysis allows more patients the independence and flexibility than assisted in-center hemodialysis. Studies have shown that patients on home hemodialysis can have improved survival rates and quality of life. Patients who are motivated, able to do self-care, have a willing partner or caregiver if required, and have a suitable home environment are good candidates for home hemodialysis. The schedule for home hemodialysis will be based on the individual patient's dialysis prescription and patient convenience. Schedules vary and include those listed here. Special mention needs to be made of hemo daily hemodialysis. These treatments usually run for two to three hours. A number of studies have shown a decrease in intradialytic symptoms, including hypotension and cramps, when treatments are done more frequently and for shorter periods. Some studies show improvement in nutritional status and cardiovascular benefits. The nocturnal dialysis sessions are usually eight to 10 hours in length at night. Most patients on nocturnal hemodialysis dialyze five to six nights per week for 40 to 20, 50 hours of treatment per week. Some studies in these populations have shown improved nutritional status, better clearances of waste products, and improved quality of life. Whether done at home or in center, the hemodialysis process differs from assisted dialysis only in terms of who is the caregiver. The process of hemodialysis is where the blood from the patient is delivered continuously from the vascular access through an extracorporeal circuit. To the dialyzer to remove waste products such as uremic toxins and excess fluid and the cleared blood is returned to the patient. The vascular access needs to be a sufficiently high flowing vessel to deliver approximately 400 to 500 mils per minute in order to adequately dialyze the patient. Here are examples of the basic equipment needed for hemodialysis. There are two hemodialysis machine types for this process. The first is known as the conventional machine and can be used at home or in center with an external dialyzer. It requires another machine for water purification called a reverse osmosis or RO machine. The two machines pictured on the right are examples of small portable machines with an integrated dialyzer cartridges that when used at home have an internal water purification system but can be used independently of a water supply when traveling with pre-mixed bags of dialysate. The portability of these machines allows the self-care dialysis patient flexibility of both time and place for treatment. These are some examples of the supplies needed to set up the hemodialysis machine and begin the treatment. As you can see, these therapies require a lot of education, skill, equipment, and supplies. The illustration of the needles brings us to the discussion of an important part of hemodialysis therapy, the vascular access. The vascular access, which is not just important, but essential. We must have a way to get the blood from the patient to the dialyzer and back. 
the patient at home has to be willing and able to master the skills needed to care for and access the vascular access. The next few slides illustrate the three types of vascular access our patients may have. The most common type of vascular access is an arteriovenous fistula, which is created surgically or interventionally by making an anastomosis between a vein and an artery. AVFs may be cre created at the risk, radiocephalic as illustrated here, the elbow, brachiocephalic, or the upper arm, brachiobasilic. An AVF is the recommended access for all hemodialysis patients because an AVF consists of the person's artery and vein and no foreign materials, it has the least risk of complications, especially infection. Maturation of the vein is the process in which the vein becomes bigger and stronger, which is crucial before the fistula can be used. Maturation may take several months and periodic evaluation should be performed to track progress. To begin hemodialysis, two needles are placed into the vein, one to export the blood to the dialyzer and the other to import the dialyzed blood. The needle sites are rotated each treatment to allow healing. This is called site rotation. A fistula is the only type of access that can be used for buttonhole cannulation, which is the repeated cannulation into the exact same puncture site and a scar tissue tunnel tract develops. The scar tissue tunnel tract allows the needles to pass through to the outflow vessel of the fistula following the same path each time. Also with an AVF, the patient usually has no restrictions in average daily living activities such as swimming or showering. An arteriovenous graft may be placed if the patient's veins are not large enough or healthy enough to be used for a, for a fistula. A synthetic graft is the most common type, but sometimes biologic grafts, either bovine or cryopreserved human vessels, are used to connect the artery to the vein. Since maturation is not a factor in the use of AVGs, the graft can be cannulated as soon as the surgical incisions are healed, which is typically between two to six weeks following placement. Because the implanted tube is a foreign material, AVGs are more prone to thrombosis and infection, require more interventions and have shorter lifespans than fistulas. Grafts may be placed in the forearm, upper arm or thigh. During hemodialysis, Two needles are placed in the graft, one to export the blood to the dialyzer and the other to import the dialyzed blood. The graft requires site rotation cannulation. A graft cannot be used for buttonhole cannulation. And like fistulas, patients have no restrictions in average daily living activities such as swimming or showering. Catheters are the third vascular access option and should only be used temporarily while a fistula is maturing or a graft is healing. The hemodialysis catheter is a dual lumen tube that is usually placed in a jugular vein with the tip in the right atrium as shown here. Blood is removed from one lumen and returned through the other continuously during dialysis at a rate of about three to 400 mils per minute. The site where the catheter comes out of the skin, called the exit site, is disinfected aseptically at every treatment and is usually covered by a sterile dressing. Though there are many brands and styles of catheters, the basic physical properties are the same. Care of the catheter is, is by facility protocol and based on manufacturer's instructions for use. CVCs have a very high risk of infection and malfunction and should be avoided if at all possible. Infection is the leading cause of hospitalization and the second leading cause of death in hemodialysis patients. Other complications of catheters include the risk for stenosis in the central veins brought about the inflammatory process and inadequate dialysis because of lower than AV access blood flows. 
Still, if hemodialysis is required immediately, a catheter may be used as a bridge until a suitable permanent vascular access, either a fistula or a graft, is placed and ready for use. For a minority of dialysis patients, fistula and graft placement is not feasible and a long-term tunnel catheter is the only access option. Patients with a CVC are strongly advised not to shower or swim, especially if the exit site is not well healed. One of those three types of vascular access must be in place in order for hemodialysis to be possible. Initiating the dialysis treatment involves cleaning the access site according to CDC guidelines and using strict aseptic technique. Before accessing a central venous catheter, the hub is scrubbed per CDC guidelines. Then the dwelling anticoagulant is withdrawn. Both lumens are flushed with saline before the catheter is connected to the dialysis lines and the hemodialysis machine pump is started. If the patient has an arteriovenous access, either a fistula or a graft, the skin is cleaned per CDC guidelines, usually with chlorhexidine, and two needles are inserted using the site rotation technique for fistulas or grafts, or the buttonhole cannulation technique for fistulas. Site rotation is done by rotating cannulation sites up and down the entire length of the fistula or graft. Blunt or buttonhole needle cannulation should only be used in AVFs where buttonholes are established. This is accomplished when the same person cannulates the fistula at the same spot, at the same angle, and in the same position repeatedly for a few treatment sessions until a track is developed. Then cannulation is done using the buttonhole or buttonhole needle. Then cannulation is done using the blunt or buttonhole needle. Buttonhole cannulation can be a great benefit for daily home hemodialysis patients who have fistulas. Once the needles are properly situated, they are secured with tape and the machine is started. The blood flow is set and the pressures are monitored throughout the treatment. For more information on the basics of hemodialysis, please see module seven. The home hemodialysis prescription will begin with a visit to the surgeon, first to assess for the vascular access and then to create it, usually an outpatient procedure. The post-op care includes assessment of AVF maturation, which takes approximately six to eight weeks, or AVG healing, also known as tissue incorporation, which takes approximately three to four weeks. Central venous catheters can be used immediately. The training to use the vascular access depends on the type of access and the skill of the patient or partner. The prescription will include initiating home hemodialysis and the self dialysis or caregiver training, dialysate prescription and frequency of hemodialysis to achieve adequacy, the diet, including fluid restriction, medications, lab testing, and clinic visits for maintenance care. While the training process may initially seem very daunting for the patient and family, we have the data from the US and around the world that it is not only possible, it can be very successful. Here's proof in two patients' own words. To my genuine astonishment, I soon discovered after my rigorous training and the initial few trial runs that virtually every single one of these fears proved groundless. And in short, self-dialysis at home was safe. Machine or health hiccups were incredibly rare, three to four times in 10 years. Support was comprehensive and inspirational and delivery of my supplies was friendly and well-managed. Yes, there is a lot to learn. We can help suitable patients make the choice of home dialysis by instilling patient confidence that they can indeed do it and we will support them throughout their learning to master their own care. This insightful image 
shows how the interdisciplinary team pre-selects potential home dialysis patients from the clinical perspective and by nurturing them through potential barriers and challenges can help them both thrive and survive. The key is in understanding their preconceived life plan and reconciling it with their medical and physical status. Patient-centered care. Here are some of the possible health-related barriers and challenges that may be encountered. Conversely, there are several medical conditions that may be a challenge for the patient on in-center hemodialysis that could be managed successfully on home hemodialysis. Add in the chronically volume overloaded patients as they are ideal for more frequent hemodialysis at home. And there are the potential quality of life benefits of self-care, such as being able to physically and cognitively manage tasks of care or have a care partner who can. Being motivated and willing to learn new techniques, wanting to work or continue school or just have plans for their life, or perhaps failing PD, but want to stay home. Wanting control over their lives. However, there still may be challenges for those wanting to do home dialysis, whether it is PD or home hemodialysis, such as those listed here. These challenges can be overcome. Having a dialysis care partner, along with education about infection prevention role of careful personal hygiene, physical therapy for the frail bedridden patient and dialysis assistance, and ongoing support of the home training staff with extra tools to train the illiterate patient. And while all four of these challenges to self-care are significant, they all can be overcome with a home care partner and or technology. Being able to choose your own hemodialysis schedule is a huge benefit for the potential self-care candidate. However, it can be helpful to do the time commitment math. In-center hemodialysis will con consume 50 to 20 hours with a scheduled appointment. The home hemodialysis will take up about the same amount of time, but without the travel. Home nocturnal will give the patient 50 to 70 hours of gentler, more frequent dialysis with all the health benefits we will discuss shortly. The next two slides outline the training curriculum implemented by the training nurse. Assessing the patient's level of understanding and preferred method for learning, the training nurse establishes a lesson plan, which usually starts with a review of normal kidney function. The training goes on to discuss the principles of dialysis, and there is a strong focus on infection control, including personal hygiene, a clean home environment, proper hand washing, masking, and strict aseptic techniques. Patients and family caregivers will need to learn how to perform routine assessment, daily care, and proper disinfection of their dialysis accesses. Prevention of two major complications of home dialysis, vascular access hemorrhage in the home hemo patient and peritonitis in the PD patient optimizes the safety of patients as well as their quality and quantity of life. Emphasis is placed on making sure that patients understand the reasons for these tasks. To summarize, home treatment requires that patients learn the home dialysis modality of choice, including the treatment schedule, procedures, and administration of intravenous or intraperitoneal medications, management of problems and or complications, maintenance of home treatment records, ordering and inventory of supplies, equipment maintenance, 
disinfection and waste disposal. Since anemia is a problem for all CKD patients, lab tests are done routinely. A patient may choose to learn how to self-administer erythropoietin, uh, how to self-administer ESAs, or may choose to come to the dialysis unit for administration. IV iron is usually given at the clinic during the patient's monthly visit. Dialysis adequacy is tested every month for hemodialysis patients and every three to four months for peritoneal dialysis patients. During training, patients are taught how to collect specimen samples. Target goals are discussed along with possible adjustments to home therapy if these goals are not met. Routine lab testing is done monthly, quarterly or semi-annually. A registered dietitian takes part in the patient's nutritional assessment and education. Cultural diversity in food preparation and incorporating the patient's diet prescription into their lifestyle often presents a challenge. All home medications are reviewed, including the indications, dosage, route of administration, and possible side effects. The social worker intervenes on psychosocial issues that might include emotional responses to CKD care, body image, financial issues, rehabilitation, and all of which may require counseling services. For home dialysis to be safe and effective, good communication is a must. Contact numbers are provided for the members of the healthcare team and supply company, along with clinic hours, schedule, and after hours coverage. As noted earlier, federal law requires that all home dialysis patients have staff support available around the clock. Resources are provided for the patient, such as publications, kidney related organizations, agencies, and informative websites. Last but not least, emergency procedures for situations such as power failure and disaster planning are discussed, such as where to go, what to, get to do, whom to call, and alternative solutions. For the PD patient, this training is usually accomplished in two weeks of daily training at the clinic. Home hemodialysis training may take anywhere from four to six weeks, some of which may be started at the clinic or all of it may be done in the home, one-on-one, -on -one, with the home training nurse teaching both the patient and partner. All skills are evaluated on the patient's independent performance before being released to true self-care. The monthly clinic visits are for holistic assessment, problem solving, and additional education as needed. A home visit will be made for complications such as peritonitis, peritonitis and exit site infection in PD and vascular access infection in hemodialysis. Let's look at some of the basic nursing considerations that you need to be aware of or if a home dialysis patient comes to you for care of a non-dialysis medical problem. One of the biggest challenges of kidney failure is managing fluid volume. Recalling that fluid or volume balance is one of the primary physiological functions of the healthy kidney, it makes sense that one of the major challenges of kidney failure is replacing that basic function. And while there is considerable patient to patient variation, the majority of chronic dialysis patients are anuric. This means that one of the two main goals of dialysis is the removal of accumulated water from the body. In PD, this is accomplished with dextrose in the dialysate, which creates the osmotic force. The PD prescription for each patient will include the percent of dextrose dialysate that the patient needs. In hemodialysis, the machine is programmed for ultrafiltration that occurs within the dialyzer as water is forced from the high pressure blood circulation to the lower pressure dialysate fluid. The amount of fluid that needs to be removed during each dialysis treatment is based on the patient's target or dry weight. This is the patient's goal, this is the patient's goal body weight, free of excess water, as in the person with healthy kidneys. 
PD patients weigh themselves daily. Home hemodialysis patients weigh themselves before and after each hemodialysis treatment. The good news of self-care dialysis is that with more frequent dialysis, these patients typically enjoy fewer problems with fluid volume management. PD patients should maintain their target weight, sometimes called their dry weight, because it is the weight they should maintain with normal kidney function. Hemodialysis should achieve their target weight by the end of every dialysis session. Target weight will fluctuate based on solid body weight gains or losses. Consider too that measured weight is influenced by many variables in, including clothing, as well as gastrointestinal and bladder contents. If the patient's target weight is overestimated, they will retain excess fluid at the end of the treatment. This may manifest as hypertension, edema, shortness of breath, or dyspnea on exertion. If the patient's target weight is underestimated, the patient is essentially dehydrated during hemodialysis. This may present as dizziness, lightheadedness, hypotension, and or muscle cramps. To be as healthy as possible, dialysis patients need to eat well. Their disease, comorbidities, and therapy mean that there are important modifications they must make. The dietary elements of importance in kidney failure are protein, potassium, sodium, phosphorus, calories, and fluids. Since kidney failure and dialysis are catabolic states, dialysis patients tend to lose solid weight. A primary goal of nutritional support for patients is to maintain solid body weight. In order to do this, most dialysis patients are encouraged to eat a high protein, high calorie diet. Most patients need additional protein so that their bodies do not metabolize existing muscle protein for energy. The daily recommended protein intake for a kidney failure patient is 1 to 1.2 grams per kilogram per day of high biologic value proteins such as meat, eggs, fish, and dairy. Potassium, sodium, phosphorus, and fluids must be limited in kidney failure to avoid electrolytic imbalances, since the dialyzer cannot physiologically balance these elements. Sufficient caloric intake is also essential for health maintenance on dialysis. The dietitian works closely with the patient to establish an ideal body weight and that the patient strives to achieve. Again, because of the catabolic nature of kidney failure, patients often to need to increase their caloric intake to maintain body weight and health. Since decreased appetite is common in kidney failure, protein and or calorie supplements are sometimes recommended to meet these nutritional needs. The dietitian is a valuable resource and will provide patients with specific dietary recommendations. And just as the dialyzer cannot physiologically correct the electrolytic imbalances, nor can it replace or correct any of the hormonal imbalances caused by kidney failure. Patients will need medication to treat the issues of anemia, mineral bone disorders, and hypertension. The home dialysis patient or caregiver is taught to manage all of his or her medications, except those that may be given in the clinic. Functioning kidneys sense when the, bodies need more, when the body needs more red blood cells in order to carry sufficient oxygen to the organs and tissues. The kidneys release the hormone erythropoietin to prompt the bone marrow to make new red blood cells. When the kidneys are diseased, they no longer produce adequate amounts of erythropoietin, which means the bone marrow receives less signaling to produce RBCs. In order to prevent severe anemia and the need for blood transfusions, erythropoiesis stimulating agents can be given either through an IV 
or subcutaneously along with IV iron during hemodialysis. The goal of using ESAs for anemia correction is to prevent the need for blood transfusions, but not to exceed a hemoglobin level of 11 grams per deciliter. Dosing varies by the type of ESA and organizational protocol. Before starting an ESA, the potential risks and benefits should be considered for each patient. ESAs that you may, that you may see prescribed for patients include erythropoietin alpha and darbopoietin. Nearly all dialysis patients will become iron deficient from frequent phlebotomy, GI losses, and for hemodialysis patients, the hemodialysis treatment itself. ESAs are much less effective if iron is not available to make hemoglobin in RBCs. For this re reason, iron supplementation is often given along with ESA therapy. Common IV iron preparations prescribed for dialysis patients are iron sucrose and iron ferric glutinate. Kadoki recommends that hemoglobin and iron levels be analyzed together when deciding on ESA therapy. And since the kidneys can no longer excrete excess phosphorus to properly regulate serum phosphorus levels, patients must take phosphate binder medications with meals. Phosphate binders bind ingested phosphorus so that it may be eliminated in the stool. This is important because elevated serum phosphorus levels are correlated with the release of calcium from bones, which can lead to vascular calcification and cardiovascular mortality. Patients on daily hemodialysis may not need to take phosphate binders or have dietary restrictions as dialysis does remove some phosphorus and the more frequent the hemodialysis, the more phosphorus is removed but conventional hemodialysis, that is three times per week, and PD do not remove sufficient phosphorus. So those patients will need to take to reduce their dietary phosphorus and take the phosphate binders to help keep their serum phosphorus levels in the normal range. Common phosphate binders currently prescribed include cevelima hydrochloride, calcium acetate, lanthanum carbonate, and sucroferric oxyhydroxide. In kidney failure, the kidneys no longer convert vitamin D, which is absorbed from the intestines into the active form of vitamin D, 125-dihydroxycholecalciferol, also known as calcitriol. Calcitriol increases the level of calcium in the blood by increasing the uptake of calcium from the gut into the blood. This deficiency of the calcitriol form of vitamin D results in stimulation of the parathyroid gland, leading to secondary hyperparathyroidism. Left untreated, hyperparathyroidism will cause calcium to be released from the bones and elevated in the blood. In order to suppress parathyroid hormone secretion, IV synthetic vitamin D analogs are given, which mimic calcitriol. These drugs will turn off the parathyroid gland and lessen the release of calcium from the bone. The most common IV vitamin D preparation prescribed for dialysis patients is paracalcitol. In addition, an oral calcimometric is sometimes prescribed to help control PTH levels. This medication acts by attaching to calcium sensor receptors on the parathyroid gland so that the gland senses sufficient serum calcium and stops overproducing. The most common calcimometric prescribed for dialysis patients is sinicalcet. The patient's CBC electrolytes and serum chemistries are monitored on a monthly basis to assess health maintenance and allow the IDT to adjust medication dosages. High blood pressure is both a cause and a complication of CKD. 
disorders of the hormones that control blood pressure and fluid management in the body lead to hypertension. Most dialysis patients will need antihypertensive medications to control blood pressure. Medication should be combined with appropriate fluid restrictions and a low salt diet in order to achieve blood pressure control. For more information about blood pressure medication with medications in CKD patient, see modules two and three. Again, patients on PD and daily hemodialysis may not have hypertension because of better fluid management. Finally, be aware that there are many drugs that are contraindicated in patients with kidney failure. And there are many medications that require dose adjustments due to altered kidney excretion or metabolism. Generally, people with advanced CKD need lower doses of medication. Conversely, some medications are removed from the blood during the hemodialysis treatment. Patients may need to take an additional dose of medication after dialysis to maintain the desired therapeutic effect. For a self-care program to be effective, we use a formal training plan applying adult learning principles, making modifications to individualized training for the patient and care partner. It's important to build on previously learned skills and concepts and follow the plan, allowing for the reinforcement the patient gets from the daily checkoff. We thoroughly document the teaching, learning, and positively review accomplishments. This training is done in different settings that use different teaching technologies. For patients doing self-care training in center, ongoing evaluation of the patient's performance and ability to build on the patient's knowledge of their disease process and care is facilitated by contact with a nephrology nurse three times per week. Additionally, assessment for suitability for transition to the home environment can be accomplished during regular treatments. The ultimate success of the patient's self-care experience is to have ongoing support. That includes home visits to assess the suitability of the environment and help start planning for the move home and then a home visit once that is done to help the patient settle in. Ongoing support comes in the form of phone calls, telehealth, daily for the first week or more, and then weekly to every other week. Clinic visits, either in person or through telehealth, will be set up monthly or more if needed, with a detailed review of flow sheets from home and any necessary reinforcement or review of education. Professional and social support for the self-care patient is critical to keep the patient safe, engaged, and capable of continuing self-care successfully. Home patient events could include regular group education classes, patient and partner support meetings together and separately. Provision for respite care, either in center or in home training, provides opportunity for the staff and patient to reassess all aspects of the patient's care environment and health. Emergency preparedness is a subject that is necessary to allay the what if potentials and covers dialysis emergencies with access related incidents as well as environmental disaster planning, water purification problems and living arrangements, which can change due to financial stresses or partner issues and there is a lifeline such as telehealth for mental health crises and stress, such as pandemic related issues. The greatest support we can give our patients to succeed at home is the appropriate education. Managing home dialysis can be one of the most complex and challenging tasks family caregivers face. People who have kidney failure are increasingly receiving hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis at home. They and their caregivers must take care of the vascular access 
and manage serious potential complications such as hemorrhage and peritonitis. In a national survey, family caregivers have noted their concerns about making mistakes and managing a loved one's pain and discomfort. Worries that may be especially acute for caregivers of someone receiving dialysis at home. When asked what would make it easier to perform complex tasks like home dialysis, the most common response from survey participants was for more and better instruction. The July 2019 Executive Order on Advancing American Kidney Health highlights the essential role of nurses in helping to prepare caregivers for managing home dialysis. An early 2021 op-ed stated that to achieve the goals of the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative, many more patients and family caregivers will need to be trained by nurses to perform hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis at home. In-center hemodialysis remains the most frequently used treatment option for kidney failure. However, patients need better education about dialysis options and alternate treatment modalities, namely homely, home peritoneal or hemodialysis. One of the major barriers to improving the utilization of home dialysis is that patients sometimes require assistance with cannulation and other procedures. If a nurse or specialized technician could provide regular in-home support, this would empower many more patients to successfully utilize this modality. Additionally, dialysis organizations should be incentivized to educate patients on all available modalities of care, including transplant, throughout patients' disease trajectory. Education should be made available as early as possible, but also repeated frequently to ensure patients are able to make educated decisions as they learn better how to cope with their illness. In summary, dialysis in the form of peritoneal dialysis or home hemodialysis offers the kidney failure patient kidney replacement therapy that provides many benefits in regards to both quality and quantity of life. PD is highly recommended for the new stage five patient as it preserves residual kidney function and delays the need for a vascular access until such time that hemodialysis may be needed or a transplant. The self-management skills of home dialysis are invaluable preparation for transplantation. Hemodialysis can be provided more frequently at home than in center and more frequent dialysis leads to decreased morbidity and mortality. Home therapies keep patients safe at home during a pandemic and in touch through telehealth. And last but not least, while not all kidney failure patients are candidates for home dialysis, many more could benefit than currently are. For more information on chronic kidney disease and kidney replacement therapies in both adults and children, please see these other modules on the ANNA website. Thank you for the care you give our CKD patients and for choosing to learn more about them and their therapies through these modules. You can download from the online library a PDF copy of these slides the printed narrative, case studies, post-test, as well as a list of references and resources, and a link to the glossary of terms. Many nurses have volunteered their time and expertise as content authors and reviewers for these modules. Their names are listed in alphabetical, in alphabetical order. ANNA thanks them all for their talent and service. For more information about CKD care and the ANNA, 
please visit our website and online library. Thank you.